Welcome to CPA Australia's live webinar presenting today. We are joined by Nicole North Vanna. Chairing today, we're also joined by Michelle Webb. Now I'm going to introduce Nicole and uh, Michelle into the conversation. Just opening up your mics there. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Linda. Good afternoon. This is Nicole North Vanna. It's good to be here. So welcome everyone, thank you for attending. So Nicole is CPA Australia's Compliance Specialist for Professional Standards. She is a lawyer with an extensive compliance background who understands that governance solutions are strengthened by the concept of public value. So I will hand over Nicole to get us started. Great, thanks Michelle and thanks for tuning in everyone. The professional standards scheme is like an optical illusion. It's a bit of a trick of, a, of, an, of the eye that, that um, might make you think you see something that is not really there or actually makes you see it differently than it actually is. So I'm, I'm hoping to um, get some clarity for you throughout this session because it's um, a complicated device really. So depending on who you are, you might see this scheme slightly differently. Practitioners may see it as an instrument that limits their liability. CPA Australia actually sees it as something that maintains high standards for the distinction of the profession. And the public actually, I think, wonder what it's all got to do with them. Clients might see it as a device that unfairly caps the amount they can sue for, while insurers may see it as helping reduce their liability. Uh, and, and the PSC, of course, the Professional Standards Council I'm talking of, um, see it as a stroke of genius to perpetuate the profession and, and um, by future-proofing it, I suppose, against rising insurance premiums. So yeah, you can see that this little scheme is a really complex device um, which once unpacked will make much more sense. To help us understand why it's so complex, we'll first take a look at the scheme's background and its architecture, the professional standards legislation. Then we'll go back to the accountant's perspective and we'll look at the scheme uh, eligibility, your obligations and some benefits. We'll also look at the risk management aspects of the scheme and how best to ensure a good foundation to avoid and manage claims. And then we'll also take a quick browse at some resources. Background. Actually, before I, st before I start with the background, I, I want to just point out that it's the current scheme which is due to expire, uh, the current scheme which is due to expire on the 22nd of um, this month actually, is not the subject of the discussion today. Instead, we'll be focusing on the new scheme which is due to commence on the 23rd of December 2019. The background to the scheme. The professional standards schemes are unique to Australia and come with the benefit of placing a ceiling on the amount of professional civil liability an eligible participant may face. The abolishment of the Commonwealth law um, uh, prohibition against economic loss in the late, uh, late last century, um, where damages could be awarded against professionals, inevitably began to, um, to the damages that, award, that were awarded inevitably began to um, rise and that put pressure on the affordability of insurance premiums. Um, and at this time, practitioners began to abandon the professions because of the increased cost of running a business and the risk of being sued by the clients and third parties. This concerned professionals and government who were concerned that if professionals were forced out of business, the public would be deprived of a valuable service. So government responded by developing a vision to strengthen consumer protection, which is really the primary driver, raise professional standards and ensure insurance affordability. And so the New South Wales Professional Standard Act was born in 1994. Ah. Prof 
professional standards legislation. So New South Wales was the first state to legislate in the professional standards space. Then the rest of the states followed suit, together comprising the professional standards legislation or what I refer to as the PSL. Uh, the PSL establishes the Professional Standards Council, or the PSC, who consider, approve, monitor and manage schemes through its administrative arm, the Professional Standards Authority. Oops, I'm going backwards, sorry guys. <laughs> um, oh, polling question. So Linda, if you could open up the first polling question for us. Thank you. So I'll just uh, take you through it. The professional standards legislation is primarily concerned with whose protection. You've got three choices, A, B or C. When you've made your, um, clicked one of them, can you please hit submit? It's down the bottom right hand corner and you have um, roughly 25 seconds to go. So the choices are A, the government, B, consumer protection and C, professionals including public practitioners. So again, just a reminder to click Submit once you've made your selection. Okay, so 52% said C, professionals, 30% said B, consumer protection, and 2% said A, the government. Nicole. Oh, great. Thanks, Michelle. So this is a perfect question to ask, um, considering what, what we've already spoken about, that, that the um, scheme is different to different people. Um, it's, it's actually consumer protection B that is the primary driver for the scheme, uh, and, and of course, from that flows a whole lot of other benefits and that is to the professionals themselves and I guess also government for, you know, to ensure that um, the economy is uh, running well as well. So, you know, it is all of those things and probably more, but the primary driver is, is consumer protection. The, uh, the government want to ensure that the work uh, a professional does, the valuable work that accountants do, is available to uh, clients or the public um, to you know to endure to endure the profession, um, but also to protect the consumers uh, by administering professional standards and keeping the standards high. So thanks very much for for answering the polling question. We can move on now to. I'm going backwards. It's terrible. I'm so sorry, everyone. I'm, I'm um, going backwards. Common question. Yeah. Right. Back on track now. CPA Australia Professional Standards Accountants Scheme. So contrary to popular belief, perhaps. The scheme is not insurance. This is an important concept to understand and I'll say it again actually. The scheme is not insurance. The scheme is actually a legal instrument that may enable eligible practitioners to limit their civil liability to the minimum PII required under the CPA Australia bylaws. The scheme may be called on and presented at court in an attempt to cap damages awarded to a client to your PII amount or your professional indemnity insurance amount. So therefore, it may prevent a court awarding damages beyond the 2, 10 or 20 or 75 million PII that you're required to hold by the bylaws. Scheme legislative exclusions. So the, the legislation expressly or impliedly excludes the following claims from the liability cap. 
claims arising from criminal liability, and that's a public uh, policy driver, really. Um, it shouldn't, uh, I don't think it, it should cap um, liability that, that is caused by some cr cr criminal misdemeanor. Uh, claims for causes of action outside the scheme's commencement and end dates. So a claim arising from a client transaction before the scheme commences or after the scheme concludes will not attract the limited liability benefit of the scheme. It does not limit liability for death, personal injury, breach of trust, fraud or dishonesty. It will be of no effect on claims below the minimum PII amount you hold and it excludes partners of, yeah, excludes partners or employees with a, a, a PPC, a public practice certificate, with another occupational organisation uh, and who is a member of another scheme. Some practical examples of the scheme. Um, so let's go through them. One, the scheme can only be relied on for a claim above the minimum PII amount. If you hold 2 million PII and a client sues you for 2.5, a court may enable the scheme to cap liability at 2 million. Example two, if your firm has both CPAs and CAs, you need to participate in both the CPA professional standard scheme and also the CA professional standard scheme and also that, that's, that's true of IPA as well. If a claim includes both professional negligence and fraud, then the scheme will not limit the liability if fraud is made out. However, it may still limit the liability for the professional negligence. The scheme will be ineffective if the cause of action arose before the scheme was in operation. And uh, five, and I think I've got two fours, but it really is five. <laughs> if eligible for the scheme while it was in force and you are sued in 2025, the scheme will still be effective in limiting your liability for acts or omissions during um, or arising during the period of time the scheme was in force. Ah, I think we have a have a question. No, no. Okay. So, are there any questions? Shoot them through if you have any. That um, because it's nice to answer a question when it's um, relevant to the discussion. So, Linda has just forwarded to us a question from Karen. If we have more than 2 million PI, can the scheme help? For example, if we held 10 million PI? Yes, yes. That is a great question, actually, because um, it, do, it will help if the scheme doesn't, uh, doesn't limit your liability. So I've just gone through a whole list of things that would exclude the scheme. Uh, so if, if there was a court case, uh, and, and you took the scheme, the scheme instrument along, but the court didn't prove it, um, then um, then that 10 million would really help. So um, if the scheme won't limit liability, then then a court can award you know whatever damages is appropriate. Um, so the greater PII you have, or or the most adequate to your risk profile, um, the better off you are. Thank you. So we have another question. So this is regarding the practical example number one. So Chen Ching wants to know, would the cap liability in this example be 0.5 million? Would the cap liability be 0.5? Because ah. you're saying um, the, you hold 2 million PI and the client sues you for 2.5. His question is, would the cap liability be 0.5? Uh, no, the, the cap will will prevent the court awarding damages above that $2 million. So in effect, the client misses out on 0.5 million. 
Thank you. And Elizabeth is asking, do you need to re-register for the scheme every year? Uh, no, you don't, Elizabeth, and that's a great question too. Uh, CPA Australia um, well, pays your annual fee every year and, and basically registers for you. So once, once, you're, once you're paid, um, as long as you're eligible, and we'll go through eligibility in a moment, uh, so as long as you're eligible, that you're in, you're in. And Baygek wants to know um, if the scheme ends in 2024, so in that case in 2025, yep. is it still claimable? Yes, yes, that's right. So that's what number, well, pretend five <laughs> is. Um, that's demonstrating that while um, the scheme might have ended, you can still use the scheme because it was uh, valid at the time the cause of action arose, uh, but it wouldn't obviously if, let's say, the day after it finished, which is 2024, December 24, I think. So if you saw a client after that time, then this scheme wouldn't help you. But hopefully we have another one by then that's, um, that, that's as helpful as this one. Yeah, I hope that makes sense. Shoot me another clarification if not. Thank you everyone. Great. We'll move on. Yeah. I think so the next thing one. is... We might have another question actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, what should we do in terms of the standard minimum text we have to have in our email and financial reports? Yes, yes. So we're coming to that shortly um, actually. So that what you're referring to is the limited liability statement or limited liability notice. Uh, and that's one of your obligations. Um, so yeah, we'll touch on that in a minute. But um, it's interesting you raise that because if, if you don't, if you don't uh, display your, the, the notice, then the scheme won't, won't work. So that's where you really want to make sure that your uh, PII insurance is adequate, just in case all these things goes goes you know go go awry. Yeah. And Jordan is asking, and I think we'll probably um, come to this shortly. We've previously had to opt out of the scheme due to the financial planning activity in our business. Will we need to opt into the new scheme, or are we automatically included? Yes. Yeah, thanks for that question too. You you are automatically included. The scheme works a little different to the last one, and uh, so everyone is in. Basically, we'll go through some eligibility uh, requirements later. Uh, but whether the scheme will work for you at court will depend on the sorts of services that you provided. So, for example, financial planning may be one of those that doesn't, but it may help you with the other services you provide. And we'll go into that in a bit more yeah. coming up. Yeah. So I think we've got a polling question next. Is we do. Next? So, Linda, if you could pop up the second polling question. Thank you. So the professional standard scheme is insurance, yes? No, not sure. You can click one of those responses and then click submit when you're done. You've got just less than 40 seconds, 30 seconds. I can't add up. <laughs> it's a good time to have a sip of water, I think. Yes, yeah. <sighs> Fifteen seconds to go. So make your response and click submit. All right. So sixty-five percent have said no. So they were listening to you, Nicole. Mm, great. <laughs> fifteen great. fifteen percent said yes, and four percent said not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's 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 really it's great to see that the lion's share um, um, realise it's it's not insurance, and it's often because it it it's somehow um, connected with PII insurance. It has the appearance of insurance, but but it isn't. It it works with insurance in that it will cap to a particular um, um, amount but it isn't in itself insurance. 
Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, we can move on to scheme eligibility now, can't we? Right. Right, CPA Australia members are eligible to participate if they conduct public accounting services in Australia. And what is public accounting services is mentioned in our bylaws, uh, but it ranges from uh, bookkeeping to, to taxation, financial planning. There's a lot in there, and, it, and, uh, and it's supposed to cover all the things that um, you as accountants provide to the public. And I'll just put into the chat box a link to our definition of public accounting services for those of you who would like to know a bit more about that. Great. Uh, so, yep, they conduct public accounting services and are a current CPA Australia member holding a CPA or an FCPA designation and have a current limited or full public practicing certificate. Uh, it's really that simple. It's just those three things. Uh, and the last tick there really should probably be a bullet point. Uh, we invite you to com complete a self-assessment guidance tool, which is available on CPA Australia's Professional Standards Scheme webpage. And we'll provide you a link to that. Um, I think we may, may have one in the uh, resources, actually. But it's a very helpful guide to ensure you understand what, what, or you know, in what circumstances the professional standard scheme may work for you, uh, and it and it also covers all your obligations. It it also has a, a a little helpful hint on on when you get some claims. So it's a good one to have handy. So then we move to obligations now. There was a question about this a little earlier, the limited liability statement. So this is one of one of your key obligations as a scheme participant. You'll need to include a particular statement on uh, and, and I think I've got a link. I've got a link there that will take you to the Professional Standards Council's page, which has the um, the, the liability statement. It's a it's a quick one, and it's supposed to be in eight point at least eight point font uh, Times New Roman font. Um, it can be bigger than that, and it can be in a different font, but it has to be bigger at least bigger than eight point times New Roman font. It's very prescriptive. <laughs> uh, and I think the spirit of it is it just needs to be seen. The, a client could argue at court perhaps that, that it, you know, it was in, in a really small font and they didn't see it. So that, that's, the, that's the idea. You want to make it, um, uh, you know, you, you want to call attention to it. So this statement needs to be on your website, your terms of engagement letters, your company letterhead and letters that are signed by someone in the practice, your receipts, written advice, and I say with compliment slips, but I think that's a bit old fashioned. You could probably leave it off that one. Newsletters and other publications, emails, brochures, and other promotional material. Really, it's whenever you're trying to sell your services and you, you want to give your client the information they need in order to engage you or not. Because as we've said before, it, it, it can um, diminish the amount of damages available to them. So uh, Lisa is asking, should the disclosure statement be included on social media pages? No, no, actually. Because um, that, I mean, it promotes your business but not really your services. Um, although having said that, if you you you, um, you could you could and and it would you know you wouldn't it, it's a probably a good idea to but you don't actually need to. Um, I think that's specifically called out on the PSC's um, um, website. Um, but yeah, again, I mean 
yeah, you can provide it anywhere. You won't be penalised for it. I'll just read out the um, relevant paragraph from the Professional Standards Council website. Michelle. So it says, the statement does not need to appear on advertisements in print media, directory listings and similar forms of promotion, business cards, social media networks, blogs, etc., that are accessed voluntarily by consumers rather than being given or caused to be given by professionals to their clients or prospective clients. Ah, nice one. Yeah, good. So the PSB website is a really helpful resource too and I think we've got that in our resources section. Uh, your obligations to maintain PII. Um, so our, our scheme is approved on the basis that we, uh, we require our uh, members to partake in certain things. And one of those is that you must hold PII. So the amount of PII that's required to be held is different depending on your income and the services you provide. It's, it's in our bylaws at 9.8, but it's also in our uh, self-assessment tool that we spoke of earlier. It will guide you through how much you're, you're required to hold. Uh, and you can also check out CPA Australia's Professional Indemnity Insurance video. I don't know whether you have already, but it's a fun little thing, maybe three minutes of, of, um, of your time. And, and it's fun and it tells you what the requirements are from our bylaws, you know, in a, in a well, friendly sort of a way. So, so check that out. Did you want to navigate to the page or move on? Let's. Let's, okay, okay. <laughs> the, now I'm, the video is a sketch video, so we're not going to play the video, but um, Nicole is just going to show you, we're going to attempt yes. to show you the relevant page, so bear with us if this does not work. Yes, <laughs> I might be a good talker, but I'm not that great in navigating new software. But bear with me, hold your breath, okay. Make, ah, here we go. So you're looking at it right now. You just need to press play. It's a fun. Well, to, not yes. Oh, not, not now, but later. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Uh, great. So yes, check that out in your own time. I'll stop sharing. We'll go back to the um, the slide. Maybe just click on the page and then try again. Right. Bear with me a moment. I think it says it's still sharing. Yep. Yeah. Is everything yep. okay there, Nicole Michelle? You guys okay? Yep, we're okay. We're back on track Excellent. now. Okay. Yep. Okay. Right. <laughs> so other obligations to comply with relevant laws, standards and codes. And um, the apes I'd like to call out specifically because they're I think they're 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 key and they cover the the breadth of the sorts of work that accountants do. They're also in our, our well, uh, prescribed in our bylaws. Um, so you can get access to the APES standards on, on our website as well. Also I'd like to call out the CPA Australia Risk Management Tool because uh, as, as practitioners you're, you're uh, obliged to have a risk management program and this tool is, is quite amazing I believe. It really, it really helps you comply with your obligations but it does more than that. I think it really helps you harness your, 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 your risks as a business. Other obligations, you're, you're required to participate in a quality review and the requirements are in the bylaws 9.5 and, and I think it's once every three years, isn't it, that you, you might be, yes, yeah, asked to participate. It's actually 
I believe it's a really helpful health check to ensure that um, you know you're up to speed with stuff. It it really it, it isn't a um, it isn't a witch hunt. It's there, it's there to help you. So you know I'd I'd like to plug that one as well. And we require that you meet your CPD obligations, and that's also a bylaw requirement. So CPA has obligations too. It's not just you. So as the scheme manager, we're required to do all these things. We have to maintain a compliance program. We have to monitor eligible participants' compliance with the scheme. We also maintain a risk management program, so we've got your back. And we need to maintain good governance, including our constitution and bylaws. We have to manage and monitor conflicts of interest. We have to have a complaints program, which uh, for you guys, well, there's, there's a couple of complaints programs. There's uh, one you can you can call in to complain about a product or service of CPA Australia, and there's also another, which is the professional conduct unit, isn't it? So clients of yours are able to complain about um, about the service you provide, and that gives us and I think you valuable information about what where your risks are held, you know, where your risks are. Um, so from from the data we collect from the complaints, we're able to see trends and then we can help support you. So Devin's just making a comment and I think it's about the risk management framework tool. Yep. Whether CPA Australia can customise a simpler version for small firms. Um, this, this tool is too much information to read and not suitable for small guys. So we take right. your feedback on board yep. and yep. we'll certainly pass that on to the relevant team. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, where are we up to? Maintain a quality re review program. Collect and analyse claims and insurance data. So we'll be asking you actually uh, annually perhaps at your time of renewal, whether you have had any claims and, um, and what insurance you hold. And this is valuable for us again from that, from that uh, risk strategy perspective. We want to see where, where claims are headed, I suppose, what, what, what the risks are to, to you guys so that we can uh, control those risks much better for you. So the more information you give us, the better we can support you. We also have to provide assistance to members, to you, to understand the scheme and and that actually means that we also have to provide information to the public uh, from, you know, customer. We, they need to know what the scheme means for them too. And we need to report to the PSC periodically. Benefits to the scheme. So I think number one, really, it's a tangible commitment to high standards. It shows that the accountancy profession is really serious about what it does and the value that it creates. Uh, it, it's great for um, the community, I think, to see, to see the, the profession as, you know, taking this stuff seriously. It's good for clients too, I think. Um, the scheme benefits, I think, a, a better, better business practices because if you weren't subject to the scheme then you may not, you know, you, you may be tempted to cut corners and, and same with CPA Australia, you know. We have to demonstrate that the scheme is a good thing. There's the increased consumer protection through PII, which I think uh, is good for your clients to see. They, they realise um, that they can be compensated if something goes wrong. There's a limited civil liability, which caps your uh, liability, your damages to your PII held and it's 
I don't know, it, it, it endures the accounting profession. And I think sort of best of all, CPA Australia pays the annual $50 fee on your behalf, which is kind of cool. Risk management. I think it's going really well for time, yeah. actually. Um, so we have a question maybe, before yeah. we move on. Mm -hmm. So um, let's see. So Brent asks, what is the timing as to when we need to have the disclosure statement displayed? For example, we have just had letterhead printed. Do we have to get it reprinted on the 23rd of December? <sighs> yeah. Look, um, look, that's uh, that's a sh that's a shame, and I'm. Um, Sorry to hear that, it, that um, perhaps we, we didn't communicate early enough. However, um, I don't know whether it's possible for you to sort of hard code. I, I don't know how you create your paperwork, but if it could be hard, hard coded on your template for creating letters, um, that would be ideal. It really does need to be on on, a, on client engagement letters and advice letters. It really does because without that, then you um, can't benefit from the limited liability in the scheme. So, um, so if, they, if it's on their email signatures mm -hmm. and if it's on uh, yeah. other digital forms, is that sufficient in itself without the letterhead being reprinted? No, I don't think so. No, and it's not the sort of thing you want to, you know, cross your fingers and hope for. I, if it's not on, on the letter, then that would be demonstrative for 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 a plaintiff to say no, I wasn't I wasn't aware. So yeah, most important, paramount even. Are there any other questions on that? Not at the moment. No, no. All right, risk management tips. Number one, ensure that the limited liability statement is displayed. Um, oh, thank you, friend. Um, yes, this is this is paramount because that will be the one thing that knocks you out. And you need to include a scheme clause containing the limited liability in your terms of engagement template. We've just re reviewed the terms of condition template, and and it includes a really nice. Scheme uh, clause, and I think it's a, a whole better, it's a, a whole lot nicer to navigate, and and it's, I think it will be helpful for you to read through that and consider establishing that as your template. Is it up online yet, Michelle? The one for uh, members based in Australia is live. The one for members based in New Zealand is still being uploaded, which is why we haven't gone out to promote it yet. We're going to promote them right together. together. Yep. But I will put a link into the chat box for the Australian one. Great, great. Thanks, Michelle. You should also, I think, periodically engage your insurer to review your level of cover and, and increase it according to your risk profile. Profile. So, as we've discussed, if you if you don't if if um, the scheme doesn't work for you, then you want to be sure that your PII is adequate. Uh, so you really need to have a look at, at the sorts of work that you're performing and and um, the sorts of customers or clients you have. You don't want to be in a situation where where you receive um, or, or the damages awarded awarded against you are in excess of the PII you hold and you don't qualify for the scheme. Um, next point, provide a link on your website to CPA Australia's Consumer Guide video and uh, I think we can we can go across to the page. I'll try it again, fingers crossed I, I don't lose anyone in the process. Right. Here we are, we've landed on the CPA Australia consumer page and here we are, there's me. <laughs> um, now I'd invite you all to 
to contact me and 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 ask for a copy of this if you would like it to, to put on onto your website to help your clients understand what the scheme is. It's not mandatory. You certainly don't have to have it, but um, it, it does. It well, it it helps. Yeah, because we want we want we want your clients to understand the benefits of going with a CPA member who is subject to the scheme, even though it may diminish the the amount of damages they can claim, they get a whole lot more. So I invite you to have a look at that in, in your own time and let me know if you would like uh, a link to it or, or a copy. So let's try and go back to... Okay, wow, great. Uh, now, um, risk management tips, I think we're down to uh, ensure that any partner or employee signing off on work is eligible for the CPA Australia scheme or another membership membership body scheme. Now I actually expect to get a couple of questions on, on these so I might just pause there a moment. So while we're waiting we do have a couple um, already. So Gabrielle is asking given it's quite a job to update all of our templates and the timing being during our Christmas break. Can we start updating our templates now? Sure, sure. So the, so the legislation requires that um, you have to display the, the limited liability notice and, and it actually has a penalty for those who don't, but not for those who do but aren't, don't qualify. So I would, I would um, recommend earlier rather than later. So to, today if you have to, Yes. Um, yeah. So bef before the scheme commences, yep. Yeah, get up and get up, get up and running as soon as you can. And Kelda's asking, has the wording changed? Um, and I think what you mean is the wording of the limited liability statement from the old scheme to the new. Yes. Also, good question. No, it hasn't. It's precisely the same. So if you if you've used it before, you can wheel out the exact same one. I think we can go on. Yeah, great. Claims. What to do when you get one? If you receive a claim or, or, or actually a notification of a cause of action against you, um, well, call your PI, call your insurer first, I think, uh, but you can do some preliminary um, uh, research yourself to see whether the scheme may help you out in this instance. So you'll need to identify whether you may be eligible for the limited liability scheme by checking that the cause of action arose during the scheme operation period that the client received the notification of the limited liability statement and that the services subject to the claim are covered by the scheme. Does anyone have any questions on that? So the scheme doesn't really operate for you unless you need it. Unless it goes to court, it, it's, um, it's just a scheme out there, a, a device that's, um, you know, perhaps there, there to support you but it has no meaning for you and until until there's a, a a complaint or a claim against you that that's when it becomes live. Are there any questions on that? Great. Resources. So here's where you find more information. There's, there's a link to our professional standard scheme page. There's a, a link to insurance and that's a whole other webinar for another time, isn't it? <laughs> and three professional standards councils. So uh, as, as, we show, as we spoke of earlier, the Professional Standards Council is a really, really good resource and you'll find risk management ideas on there as well. 
the liability statement, etc. There are also some other resources, the Scheme Self-Assessment Guidance Tool, which, which I really recommend you take a look at. The Scheme Exemption Application Form, so if you really don't want to be part of the scheme, you need to request an exemption. Um, otherwise, you're automatically in. There's a link to the Chubb Elite Excess Professional Indemnity Insurance Policy, which is a runoff policy. Some, some of you or many of, of you may have been part of the scheme 2017, I think, when it lapsed for a very short period of time. So we have an insurance policy there to cover you for, um, oh, it's a sort of a boost to your PII for any uh, um, claims arising during that period. And it's a three month period, I think. Um, but if you follow that link, you'll find out the details. There's a link to the APES standard standards. There's also a link to the uh, video for consumers and you, and another video for the professional indemnity insurance. Upcoming webinars. So, Michelle, did you want to talk to that one? So, we've um, put up there some of the webinars that we'll be running next year. These are the uh, compliance risk series of webinars, but we will also be having a series of um, business advisory, practice management related webinars. We just don't have the links for those yet. But the landing page that's there, the complimentary webinar, webinars landing page, that will uh, have a list of all of the webinars as they go live. And if you want to go on an email list and be personally advised every time a new webinar goes live, then you can email live chats at cpaaustralia.com.au and we'll add you to that email list so that you get um, an individual email every time a new webinar goes live for registrations. So you can see that the, um, this risk management series includes another webinar on the Professional Standards Scheme in February. Risk management and quality control in March will um, incorporate both the APES 325 and the 320 tools that Nicole has referenced. In April, the public practice update will deal with uh, new resources, uh, projects, consultations and advocacy in the public practice space. In May, that is dealing with the CP Australia's professional indemnity insurance offer specifically for members. In June, the focus is on engagement and authority documentation as you move into the tax period. And in July, we'll look at the resources that we provide for you to help you with your year-end returns. And we'll also provide a tax time update for members based in Australia and New Zealand of the key changes and things you need to be across when you're preparing returns for your clients for 2020. Feels weird saying 2020. Yes. <laughs> and the, um, in August, we'll look at the cyber and data risk issues. So that's just for the first half of the year. And more will come soon. Uh, just Stanley, yes, I apologise for that slide colour. It is hard to read with the blue on the blue. Yes. We will certainly fix that the next time. Yeah. Yes. Is the yellow okay, Stanley? Is it just the blue? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, any more questions on today's topic? So while we're waiting for people to maybe um, type into the chat box any final questions, perhaps, Nicole, if you can just give us a Key message, mm. snapshot? Yes. Well, gosh, key message is the, the scheme is not insurance and it's not, it's not a panacea to uh, all your business problems. It's, it's a risk management tool, but you really need to be um, fully aware of, of, your, of your business risks because the scheme may not um, cap your liability and so therefore you, you, you need to have sufficient insurance to cover 
any damages that might ensue. I think I think that's it. I think that's the key message. Thank you. Um, so Jason Cunningham asks, should I be doing this as an individual or a business? If business, does it matter if some partners are not CPA members? As as an as an individual, um, well, the scheme does cover individuals, but it will also cover those individuals who who work for you, uh, but aren't entitled to our scheme. So, if you have a CA employee who has a public practicing certificate, you will need to uh, ensure that that he or she is covered by that scheme as well. Um, so yeah, it kind of yeah, it works in sort of funny ways. Um, does, that, does that make any sense? So our scheme will cover you if you're eligible and anyone that works for you if they're not entitled to be part of another scheme or our scheme and aren't. Samala's so asking, do we need to pay extra? No, CPA Australia pay the $50 fee to enable you to participate. Uh, you don't have you don't have to pay at all, which is rather a nice message around Christmas, isn't it? Um, Ankit is asking, how does it impact CPAs working in business and industries and not providing public accounting services and not having a public practice certificate? How does it help? How does it impact? How does it impact? Short answer is it doesn't. It doesn't. So it, it, the scope of the scheme is for public or, uh, accountants that provide public accounting services, have a, a PPC or hold a PPC, and have a CPA or FCPA designation. So, so it, 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 it won't enable anyone else to participate. Uh, Deb, and with regard to your question regarding uh, CP Australia's PI insurance offer, the PI insurance scheme that we make available to members is comprehensive and it covers off all the requ requirements that you need to meet under the bylaws. Yeah, yep, yep. Uh, and I, I should also mention, I did have a note about it, but I've, I've, um, I've, I seem to have misplaced it. Um, some, some services that you provide uh, require you to be licensed, so or, or registered. For example, tax practitioners, um, liquidators, auditors, and there's probably some others I just can't think off the top of my head. Uh, as a condition of that registration or license, you must hold PII, uh, a particular type of PII insurance, and, and they will be legislated according to the um, particular legislation that enables the registration of the license. And they may be slightly different to CPA Australia's bylaw requirements. So you need to be aware of, of those two. I will be working on a comparative analysis, but it's not ready yet. And, and I'd like to be able to tell you for sure um, that all, all those, all the CPA Australia requirements are exactly the same or, or better than, than the um, PII required under legislation, but I can't. Uh, so you will need to, to make sure that, that, that you comply with the legislation as well as the CPA Australia bylaws. Thank you. Well, that concludes our session for today. We hope you found it beneficial and we look forward to seeing you at the next session in 2020. And Linda, I'll hand back to you to formally close off the session.
Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Nicole and Michelle for a fantastic webinar. Special thanks, everyone, for your participation as well as for your attendance today. That does formally conclude today's webinar. To exit, please feel free to click on the cross on the top right of your screen. Upon exiting, you'll be automatically redirected to a feedback form. Now, the feedback form only takes about 30 seconds to complete. However, it's really, really beneficial for CPA Australia as well as Nicole and Michelle. Michelle, so please leave us your thoughts. Now before we do close, just having a look at the chat box, there's a lot of thank yous, so thank you very much to Nicole and Michelle. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. What I might do now is I'll pop on the music as you all exit, hoping everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thank you. Thanks so much.